Have you ever felt invisible? Once, I built a railroad. There he is. More. How do you? It's Kenji, as you probably know. It's titled mm. Hobo Man. The response is amazing. Arguably the hit of the show. Mm. Wolfson, female figure, four years ago. No, it's new. Vastly different themes. It's an iteration. No originality. No courage. My opinion. Well, I absolutely respect the power of your point of view, but this encompasses on a global scale. There's just such a sense of now and in your face, which speaks to pop and cinema and economics. I mean, you can feel the winds of the apocalypse. I can't save you. We have a $4 million hold, a major bar in Shanghai. Will you be running a review today? Listening to a podcast exploring faith and fear, what scares us and what saves us. This is the fear of God. Hello, and welcome back to another wonderful episode of the fear of God. Your favorite podcast, my favorite podcast that often deserted, uh, though growing increasingly somewhat populated, uh, intersection between faith and horror. Here we discuss what scares us, what saves us. We, we find the holy in the horrific. We are the fear of God. L- talking to you right now is Nathan Rouse, one of your hosts. Are we co-hosts? Are we hosts? Am I one of your hosts? Am I one of your co-hosts? Does it really matter? I don't know. Typically with me is Reed, but I'm I'm kind of sad to report that though we've had a long-standing relationship of friendship and, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you'd call what we do on the Fear of God business, but business and friendship relationship, after a very long time, Reed said he was leaving me for John Don Don. And I just, you know, I'm I'm really heartbroken and uh, frankly a little frustrated but maybe maybe he'll join us in a minute and he can kind of explain himself um in the meantime to sort of ail me in my time of kind of sadness i would appreciate you our community if you if you're still out there and haven't left me as well for john don don uh if you do me a favor do us a favor if there is still in us go to itunes write a wonderful review or if you just don't like us, write that review too. We'll post it to the Instagram and let everyone know your iTunes name. Um, but regardless, uh, we want your reviews. It's helpful maybe on some level, um, but it's still kind of cool and we appreciate that sort of feedback. It'd be really awesome if you would do that. Read! Hey, buddy, you're back. You, Hello. Did you, did you and old Don Don? <laughs> are y'all done? Me, me and Don Don, we are done. We are done. <laughs> Darling, I'm so glad that we could have this little chat, but I do have to tell you that I will be writing a review of your opening, and it was quite derivative. Uh, although full of the appropriate pith and vigor, uh, it, uh, it it is somewhat derivative. So uh, don't let that be too well, discouraging sorry. for you. Uh, I'm forward. sorry you feel that way. I'll, I'll do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> really? Worst film you ever saw. Huh? Well, my next one will be better. <laughs> <laughs> hey buddy hey man how are you doing i'm good reed welcome back i'm glad you haven't actually left me for anyone much less someone named john don don john don really don is a, really is a great name though um it does remind um, me of uh, bob blah blah yes bob blah blah <laughs> also a great name um i don't know if you're keeping up uh at home reed but we are in week three of our current series, Netflix and Chills. Ta-da. Um, did we steal it from them? Did they steal it from us? It kind of doesn't matter. It's where we're at. Um, two weeks ago, <laughs> we did 1922. 
a, a wonderful little dark tale, a morality play, if you will. Last week, we discussed Gareth Evans' Apostle. And this week, we're, we're moving into the art world with Dan Gilroy's Velvet Buzzsaw. So dun, dun, welcome dun. back, buddy. Thank um, you. Welcome back yourself. And, Thank you. Anything you need to chat so, about well, or want to talk about or want to get off your chest while we're here? As we, I mean, as we're recording this, it's still some time away. But uh, as this airs, uh, this coming Sunday will be, you know, the Super Bowl of the film world. It will be the Academy Awards. They will be hostless. They will be excising certain awards during the commercial breaks. Uh, who knows? I mean, by the time this actually broadcasts, <laughs> maybe they won't air anything. Maybe more changes will have happened. Maybe they'll been just like, you know what? We're just going to re-air the Grammys. That's all we're going to do. And you can How read. How dumb! Oh. Like, what an embarrassment to people who hear me. Like things like award shows and entertainment industries, sort of like uh, reviews for a podcast in the grand scheme of things, are kind of blips on a radar. But for people who do actually kind of But they're of very important bit, to us, so please review. It yeah, I mean, you know, well, yes, 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 of course. Uh, make sure you do that right after you're finished with this episode or just pause <laughs> it right now and go do it. Um, what I was trying to say is, you know, I, for people who like movies and regardless of what you think about, oh, this movie should have won, that movie shouldn't, or the movies I want to see win or never nominated, whatever, it's still a a fun event if you kind of plug in it's still if you like movies something you at least are mildly paying attention to sure and it feels like they are just like it feels like they don't even want to do the oscars it's it well it's bad and it all it all began with that kevin hart controversy yeah um yeah. which we don't have to get well no it. no it began with a popular oscar category brother oh that's right um, that happened before that whole thing yes yes it popular did. Yes, oscar it did. category which i'm so glad they did away with joke yeah that's yeah. that's ridiculous and you can so tell, particularly with the nominations that have now been announced, you can so tell that they were looking for a way to have a category to excise Black Panther to so that they would not have to nominate it for Best Picture. At least that's what it feels like, because it's like, oh, yeah, uh, we'll just give it to the, to that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, uh, it's just, I don't want to call out the, yeah, I mean, that's exactly <laughs> That's a, we're we're in Black History Month. Yes. Uh, in a minute, we're going to talk about an important piece of black film and cinema. But oh yes, y- yeah. Hear me. I'm not trying to argue the case that systemic racism meant they wanted to put Black Panther in the back of the list. But yeah, it was a way to sort of I don't know divide the quote unquote art house stuff from the popular stuff, which. I mean, I was, I don't know if we've had this conversation, this particular version of this conversation on the show before, but I was never a huge fan of the, I I can see an argument to be made in its favor, but when it initially happened, I was not a huge fan of them going from like five films to 10 anyway. It it just feels like you're starting. Well, I've I've grown to be okay with it and appreciate its, its potential at. Because really all that is, is just another way to get people to watch more of the movies they're after. Um, And the popular Oscar, you know, you could see where, I guarantee you if they had gone through with that, things like A Quiet Place, uh, possibly like Mary Poppins, um, you know, some of literally the popular movies of the year get sort of sidelined there. But then kind of like, in my opinion, the animated category, what you start to do is potentially dilute what should be up against everything else. Right. Well, and it's like I mean, they've they've always had their heads somewhat confused about this because now, you know, even with this current slate, you've got Roma nominated for best foreign language film but then also nominated for best picture and being the only foreign language film nominated for best picture, then isn't it a shoe in for that film and I you know, I mean it 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 it, this idea I don't of, know how I don't I'm sorry to cut you no, off. I don't know how Roma won't win Best Picture at this point. I mean he he and it have won almost everything. Oh, um, interesting. And that is uh, despite uh, us being in a series about Netflix, uh, Roma is one of the films I have not seen. Um Oh, really? Yeah. We well um, the biggest reason that I haven't seen it is because my wife and I like to watch them together and just she and I have not had the opportunity to sit down and watch those. We usually try to catch up with at least the best picture nominees before the ceremony. Uh-huh. Um hopefully by the time the ceremony actually airs we will have been able to do that. But yeah, we just haven't made it to Roma. We've seen a couple of the others, but yeah, just haven't well, clicked Roma. Well, I yet. will I will I will encourage you. So 
I I don't know that I would have until maybe this conversation recognized just how big a, a Quaron fan I am. I mean, Children of Men we've talked about before. Oh yeah, is I a love top it. Five film for me. Yeah, I respect Gravity. Um, I like Azkaban. Um, mm-hmm. I've not seen Tambien, but I would encourage you to watch Roma. Just know, like, it is slow. It is black and white. That doesn't bother me. It is. It is foreign. Well, I know it doesn't bother you. I'm just saying, like, you know, if you're sleepy at the end of the day, <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to watch this movie. You may be hurting yourself there. That said, Roma is worthy of the accolades it has received. Mm. Um, in terms of what he does, just from a filmmaking standpoint, in terms of the craft. Yeah. So it stands out from that standpoint. Now, the first half of the movie is pretty intellectually compelling. Read from about the midpoint on i was basically weeping the oh time. Wow. wow i mean it's wow. there's That's there's a there's there's a scene at about the midpoint i don't remember precisely where it falls but roughly in the midpoint that's very heavy emotionally and it kind of circles back around to some of that emotionality by the end of it and yeah it's 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 a powerful film well, i don't i don't interesting want to hang out there for too sure, long but sure sure it, sure it is a very very good movie now let me ask you this are there any uh, with what sounds like both of our relative, I won't even say I'm disinterested in the program. I'm I'm interested. It feels like they don't want me interested. <laughs> no, um, it does. You know, like the Kevin Hart thing happened. Well, then I don't know if you saw this. They were floating. I don't know if they'd uh, f- issued formal press release or they just leaked to see how it would float or or whatever. But they were floating having the Avengers host the Oscars. Are you, you serious? No, I didn't see that. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Wow. Like for about a week or two, that was kind of the, the new buzz post Kevin Hart was, oh, well, let's get, which hear me, if you can get all those actors to do it, that that is the juggernaut franchise sure. of the decade. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, it, it's going to get people watching it, but, you know, good luck getting enough of those people <laughs> to sign on to that. No kidding. Um, no kidding. But anyway, are are there any particular like is there something you're rooting for that you have seen like or or you know that you're well, really interested to see how it plays out? Well, I am so the the films that I am most uh, anxious to watch of the nominees that I still haven't made it to yet is I'm really hoping I get to see A Star Is Born. I'm pretty sure I will. Mm-hmm. Um I'm really hoping to get to see Roma, which that's very likely given its accessibility. Um but of the nominees that I've seen, Honestly, the 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 one that I enjoyed the most and I'm kind of pulling for the most is Black Panther. I mean, that was the film that I just and it, here's what's funny about it. I really enjoyed Black Panther. Uh I would say there right. are elements of Black Panther that I loved, but Black Panther's not even like my favorite superhero movie. It's just the it now it's become the kind of thing where I am so rooting for that film because of how well constructed it is, because of right. the cultural impact it made, because of its potential to really open up some conversations in some other areas. It's just, even though as a film in and of itself, it didn't push some of the buttons in me that other f- superhero films or other films like it have done, it's the, it, it's the one for me to root for at this point, just because of all of the ancillary elements attached to right. it, you know? Oh, trust me, I really, not that you're necessarily stating you think it will, but I really don't think it will win, not because it's not great, but I do think there's some pretty stiff competition actually in this category, but Mm. that would be amazing. Oh my gosh. If Black Panther won. Yeah. And it's it's hard because I would be in that weird position of like, Roma, you are as a film very much worthy of this award but black the panther i'm so excited for you this is awesome. <laughs> um, that that's kind of what i would end up feeling um so I, uh go ahead yeah go ahead i was just gonna say so risking some negativity on my part i want to mention something uh-huh. in passing Uh-oh. um that i don't like to say what i'm hoping won't happen oh, no. like what i'm i don't like to talk about a film or performances in the light of like <laughs> oh i hope they don't win but i'm about to do right. that very thing right now so i've now seen vice and mm-hmm. i will say before i make my somewhat disparaging comment that i found vice very entertaining i was never bored it's pretty propulsive as a film uh, i think its editing is very creative and very well constructed but i genuinely hope that Christian Bale does not win Best Actor for Vice because I feel like that film in general had such overt and apparent disdain for the characters. Now I'm 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 
not in like a unanimous opinion here. Uh, I've I've had some pushback when I've expressed thoughts like this before, but I felt like the the film and the filmmakers just so disliked the characters that it was portraying, uh, like Cheney and Rumsfeld and uh, even President Bush, and I just feel like it was so overtly disdainful towards them. And then when Bale won the Golden Globes, uh, you and I both have theater backgrounds, and I got into a little mini argument on social media about this, where in his Golden Globe speech, Bale had said, I'd like to thank Satan for inspiring me to do this role. Do you remember that? Or do you, do you remember hearing oh, yeah. about that? Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. here's my feelings on that. We don't have to have a long conversation about it, but I certainly would invite pushback if you have any. The moment he said that, I like Bale. I mean, we've, we've sung his praises on this podcast before. He's an interesting actor. He is, you know, never fully like a, an automatic draw for me, but I'm very compelled and interested to see what he does next. But when he said that, first place my mind went was, I was like, wow, you, you must have hated this guy while you're embodying the character. And the for my framework, the theater bug in me woke up and said like, yeah, you don't, you're not supposed to ever enter a portrayal of a character by hating that character. You're supposed to, you know, find what makes that character tick and embody it. And yeah, you can, after the fact, acknowledge all kinds of uh, things that you don't like that they did or, that, you know, that how they were. Um, but it just struck this wrong chord in me. And I know it was a quip. I know it was a joke. Sure, sure. You know, I'm, I'm not I'm not idiotic enough to think that he really thought that he was making a funny pun. But it really did reflect in his attitude, and then when I saw the film, I felt the exact same way. I was like, man, they, they, they hate these people. And it just, it, I don't know, it, it soured it to me to the way that I would be actively disappointed to see him win. So that, I just, I'm putting it on the record, at me if you want, but yeah, there it is. Well, I'll at you in real time. <laughs> um, I did see Vice, the only, the only best pictures i haven't seen are green book and um bohemian but um themselves but each of those plagued with their own sort of production woes uh since gaining wider recognition mm. um i mean i think that adam mckay's style is not really my style and so oh, i already approach his films and hear me, the only one I'm ever, I'm only really thinking in my head of as a counterpoint is the big short, which I think is fine, but yeah. is also this kind of somewhat frenetic, although Vice amps that up significantly, right, this kind of right. frenetic, frenetic shooting style. Um, I do think it, there's a world where there's a more thoughtful version of what Vice ultimately is. I would push back a little on now. I'm going to say these things and I've listened to Adam McKay be interviewed about the movie. Yeah, and so I'm yeah. a little more empathetic just to the point of view. Cause, cause you hear him talk about the sources he used and there's some journalism like, like I don't, I understand your point. I think it's a little more well-rounded than maybe you perceived huh. in, in the actual film. Mm. Um, but, but again, this, this, or, or rather, their intention was to show a more, which I guess th this is the challenge, isn't it? I mean, you're effectively portraying if 60%, if almost 50% of the events the character Bale portrays are legitimate, it's kind of easy to understand why they are so up in arms over the character. Sure, you know yeah, I mean? of course, of um, course. And so I'm, I don't know. I, I, I just think it's one of those pieces that's so of the moment yeah. that it's hard, to, it's hard to be objective about. Um, I, I would not be disappointed to see Bale win. I love Christian Bale. I think he's a fantastic performer, but, but I do sort of echo it's kind of expected at this point. It would be more interesting to me to see Bradley Cooper win because unfortunately, Star is born for, and I'm, I love to star is born. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a great film. Um, I think it's incredibly well acted and shot and directed and written and performed. I worry honestly that because it is not, we actually meant for this Oscars conversation to be like three minutes long. Um, <laughs> I worry that because it isn't socially relevant, quote unquote, that that is what is sidelining it mm, through award season. Cause mm. it's, 
because it has won nothing except song for shallow yeah like yeah. literally and so i do it would be pretty awesome to see cooper win just because he has he is great in it yeah and he yeah. worked his ass off for it and has just not been recognized sure no um, i understand I understand and and in truth, I'm I'm looking at the list right now. It's Bale, Bradley Cooper, Willem Dafoe, Rami Malek, Viggo Mortensen. I am neutral on Bale. I like Bale, so I will not be disappointed. Mm. But I'm neutral on him winning. Uh, I haven't seen the Dafoe performance, but it feels like traditional kind of Oscar bait. Sure. Yeah. I I will be a little disappointed if Malek or Mortensen win, even though I'm. I, I like them both fine as performers. So yeah, I feel kind of stuck on that. Craft yeah, I know. Right. Just... And well, and that's the, anyway. that's the way maybe to wrap a bow on the whole conversation. That's the way I feel about really the entire lineup this year. Like, I'm just kind of like, uh, I, I'd like to care. I'd like to care more than I do. I'll just put it at that. Like, I'd like to, I'd like to be more invested than I am. And as you pointed out, it feels like they almost don't want me to be. <laughs> So, I don't yeah, know. well, I, I will say, though, I mean, I said it a minute ago, I, I do think there's some great films uh, mm. in contention. Um, I don't even necessarily mean all of the um, best pictures. I just mean across the board. There's some really good films here. Now, I do. I can't get away from this. So uh, uh, apocryphal fear of God story. Uh, we may have one, at one point have recorded an episode that never saw the light of day <laughs> in which I like uh um the last jedi of a year and a half ago or whenever that was i i got impassioned i did likewise for another film that i've not had the chance to return to read i like i honestly care less this who knew you could actually feel this way as a film fan i care less about the best picture category if I thought Panther was going to win, I would care a lot. Sure, um, no, but I, I don't think I don't think it is. So I'm more just kind of interested. But I care less about the best picture category than I do the best animated feature category because, brother, oh my oh, gosh, yeah. uh, in Into the Spider Verse has been knocking it out. Yeah. Uh, oh, not yeah. only is it a fantastic film, and it is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sorry, any any haters out there oh man you know who you are <laughs> um any wow. haters out there this is a fantastic film i love you um <laughs> but <laughs> he's not talking but, about me for those of you who are confused right, right, right. No. <laughs> i love that, <laughs> that one film. hater um, um uh this is a fantastic film it is thematically just a knockout it is stylistically ambitious it is substantive as the day is long. I'm telling you, we, you and I have made conversations about this over the years on the show and off it. Like Pixar has some competition nipping very, very strongly at its heels from a studio perspective and in terms of just content out there. I th I'm thinking of Kubo and Laika, although their upcoming one, I'm a little, it looks a little like a step backwards, but. But Spider Verse won animated feature of the Golden Globes. Mm -hmm. It won. Um, there was another. Was it the DGA? Uh, P, some some other one of the guilds. It just won at. It will surprise me at this point if it doesn't win, which is absolutely thrilling. Yeah, because yeah. it de it deserves it. Um, so wonderful. You know, even if you had other hyper strong contenders going against it it would still be very difficult to convince me that it would not deserve winning best animated feature. So yep. I will be just, <laughs> Hey, Hey, fear of God listeners. If you care about the Oscars and you watch it that night and spider verse does not win, just know I'm like screaming and cussing <laughs> because that's the only one I super care about. Yes, so I hear that anyway. So the Oscars are coming up and that's our yeah. not too, not too brief thought. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess in the spirit of that, uh, I guess it, it, it's, it's that time again to ask what you watching, what you reading, what are you listening to? What, 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 what are you listening to? What are you listening to? Do? You know, the the things I don't know that I'm going to want to be able to do in a moment, and because we just had this big Oscars conversation, I wish I could figure out. I, I don't have the musical brain to do this as, as quick as someone like you might, and I don't know that you're familiar enough with this song to even do it, but to be able to sing What You're Watching to the tune of Shallow would be baller. Would oh. be so baller. If I had ever um, heard but, Shallow, I've never, I've never heard it. 
Are you serious? Well, I haven't seen the movie, so I wanted to wait to you hear the soundtrack. You have seen I know, that movie. but I wanted that, to wait to listen that, to the soundtrack. Oh, my gosh. Till I watched the movie. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Oh, my gosh. You need to play it. it it is absolutely and utterly irrelevant to our entire episode, but you need to play it as our outro music. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's um, funny. But I, I, I will give mad props to you. We're recording the day that the Apostle episode, not the Apostle, but uh, right. the episode uh, on Apostle <laughs> released. And my brother, my, my Downton Abbey brother, just blew it up. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh so what you watching, what you reading? Um, last, what was the one we did where we, oh, uh, Split. I mean, not Split, um, glass. glass. So in like fashion read, we sort of planned ahead and have a mutual what you watching. Yeah, there's something we wanted to talk about. Yeah, so uh, this is so funny. Uh, he's He's got a low-key non-call out already and we're about to give him a high key shout out so blake collier uh longtime listener uh has shown up on a couple of our episodes the the quarterly kings uh for two reference to both you and i i don't know if that was that was my first awareness of it a while back um Mm. about a book called horror noir n-o-i-r-e and uh, Blake has good taste, and except when it comes to Spider Verse, and <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, had recommended that at the moment in time that it kind of hit my radar through him, I didn't follow the lead. But then uh, both you and I are on Shutter, the the yes. horror streaming service, um, and they have just for this month, presumably for Black History Month, released a documentary of the same name, charting effectively the history of black cinema as far as horror is concerned. Um, I would, so I would I feel, tweak feel that. Free, yeah. Yeah. I would tweak please. that description uh, uh, of uh, black people in horror cinema. I think it, I, I mean, both applies both your descriptor and mine, but I feel like it's, yes. it, it's, it's, it's very about the treatment of black people throughout horror cinema history. And you, from a character it, standpoint and from a production standpoint. Exactly. No, exactly. And it's interesting because, like, I did, I was not aware of it being a book. I had, fa- I had heard about it through Shudder, through being subscribed to Shudder. Because every, every so okay. often, I will just, they'll drop something in that's just like a promotional trailer where they'll just say, like, hey, in about two months, get ready for this. And so, you know, they, they had done that for Horror Noir. And um, so I was I was very excited. But here was what was great about it. I had forgotten that it was going to be released. And as I periodically do, if I'm just in the mood to watch something, Shudder is one of my go-tos where I'll say, like, well, let me just pull up the app and see what if they have anything new. Well, I happened to pull it up, like, the night before it was a, its official release date. So because I'm on the West Coast, if I open up the Shudder app at, like, sometimes 7 or 8 o'clock even – they've already dropped something that had an official quote-unquote release date of the next day. And so I, I opened it up. I can't remember exactly what time, but I saw like, oh, wow, Horror Noir is already there. I was looking for something to watch. This is a no-brainer. I'm just going to dive right in. And uh, I want to hear your thoughts on and the experience and everything, but, I mean, I was absolutely blown away. I was really, really captivated by it. I feel like it's an exceptionally well-constructed documentary. I feel like it is sensitive to both the intellectual side of things and the the sort of critical element to things, but then also has a tremendous amount of just fandom and fan geek love for horror cinema and uh, for some of these milestones, these landmarks along the way. Um, It's poignant. It's informative. It's thought-provoking. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I've wanted to revisit it almost since the day I saw it. Well, I want to give some quick props. So... The book uh, was written by, and she has a PhD, um, a woman named Robin R. Means Coleman. Um, You can find her on Twitter. She's also featured very heavily in the documentary. Um, A producer of the film who also features very heavily is a woman named Tananariv Du, D-U-E. And it's directed by Xavier, I don't know if it's Bergen or Bergen, but it's B-U-R-G-I-N. Uh, regardless, they have done a real feat. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if I don't know if you know this, but in a, as I have started to, there's a way in which much of my fear of God life has existed only in relationship to fear of God. 
yeah if that makes any yeah, sense. yeah 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 but you know maybe kind of fear god 2.0 and just as i've started to embrace what we're doing a little more heavily i've started to venture out a little bit and see hey what are who else is out there doing what there's a whole like african-american woman world related to horror like mm. there's several uh twitter accounts of african-american women and and featuring and talking about horror movies mm. it's just really fascinating to me I do have this whole like, oh my gosh, I've grown up so ignorant and I'm almost 40 years old. And, you know, you finally, you find, you finally start broadening your horizons. It's like, oh, this is really fascinating and really cool to hear. So as far as the documentary is concerned, it's just really cool to hear not just the personalities I just referenced, but they feature explicitly, uh, Keith David is on there. Yeah. And what's the gentleman's name who was Candyman? I can't Tony remember. Tony Todd. Tony Todd. Yeah. yeah. And, who I as met. well as just. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so... Of course you did. No, I mean, of course I did, but no... Tell, tell us about well, it. No, I, well, no, I... Well, listeners who may not remember or may not have listened to the Get Out episode, I, I shared this story on Get Out, but basically, uh, he came into the store when I was working at the Virgin Mega Store, and... We had mm-hmm. some uh, we had some figures some uh, figures from the Todd McFarlane line and we had a Candyman yeah. figure. He comes in and I rapidly was like, "Oh my God, please sell me this Candyman figure so that I can have him sign it to me." And it is currently sitting with uh, much affection up on one of the shelves in my closet where it's being properly cared for. But uh, it is uh, yeah, it, and he was super nice and it was really great and yeah, it's awesome. So anyway, proceed. Well, yeah, but they they feature. Um you know, folks like him, some producers, some directors, Tales from the Hood director. Um, I don't know. I, I I actually, you and I texted a little bit. Part of this just comes from having a full life and it's hard to have foresight on some of these things. In hindsight, I wish we had done and maybe, you know, put a pin in this for next year, do mm. uh, for Black History Month, a, a, a run of uh, some of these movies they reference. Like I, watching horror noir, I was like, I'm kind of intrigued by you know some of the movies they profile yeah um, yeah oh yeah and that would be kind of cool to kind of cool to do i mean hashtag horror noir you know, we, i would i would love that i know no awesome. i would love that uh, yeah stay tuned for that likely series coming up i mean <laughs> it's uh it's a shame we didn't know about it and didn't you know couldn't have done it in conjunction for february but i mean we can right. we could do it at any time i would i would love that i'd love to feature Candyman. i'd love there, there were several of those films that I've looked for excuses to see that I would love to take that opportunity for. And, um, yeah, Candyman's been a, been a favorite of mine for a long time. But what I liked about the documentary, uh, there were so many things I liked about it. But, like, for instance, with a film like Candyman, and they acknowledge this, they're like, it's amazing, but it's also problematic. And I loved right. that in their extrapolation of these things that something could be both. Uh, I find right. that so yes. rare, and you and I have talked about it on the show, that it's like, if it's not perfect, thus it's garbage. And I loved... Right. How that for for really almost everything they cut it right down the line of like hey this this is great but it's also problematic this was a lot of fun but this perpetuated this stereotype and and I mean it was it it was really it was great because everything was done with the kind of spirit that was just felt very invigorating and I feel very uh, like hopeful for the future of you know just horror cinema and diversity in cinema in general. Um, it was, it was really exciting. Well, and two, two final notes, although, well, for me, feel free to say more, but one, I don't know outside of Shudder if it's available. It's a Shudder original. So I think you have to, but what I will recommend if you have not already done it, uh, they, they have multiple free trials set up. Hmm. So, you know, yeah. if you're a fan of this, the academic side of some of what we do around here, it is definitely worth your time it's absolutely it's it's interesting it's compelling it, it'll help you see some of this stuff through a new lens i do want to comment though on two things i don't have the character's name in front of me but it was beautiful seeing the impact the character from night of the living dead had oh my gosh like, that was yes. really yeah. really powerful to watch everybody talk about what was the character name? Do you remember? Uh, yeah. I don't. Uh, ben is the character in is oh, the character's yes, name. Yeah, Dwayne yeah, yeah. Jones is the is the actor. But okay. yeah, but yeah, the like I loved that line, and it's it was funny because it's the actor. I don't know if you recognized him. Uh, the actor who says what I'm about to say, the quote was the guy uh, Kincaid, I think is his name from Nightmare on Elm Street Three. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. When it when it pulled up, and you know Ben's character from Night of the Living Dead is like, "You're the boss down there. I'm the boss up here." 
And, you know, uh, the the actor who played Kincaid in Nightmare on Elm Street was like, that's history. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, yes, because it was yeah. like 1968 when he said that. And it was just, oh, man, it was, it, it's incredible. Well, yeah. and just and you referenced this on our Night of the Living Dead episode, but them talking about the the real life intersection of mm. uh, Martin Luther King's assassination yeah. right at right right at or right before the release of that movie and. Just a really powerful sort of conversation point there. But the last thing I want to mention that I loved about it was I love the notion that I kind of would have, this didn't surprise me, but it was really beautiful to see just how big a deal Get Out was. Yeah. Like, yeah. That is a major, major touch point for, you know, black horror cinema um, in a way that I think I nominally understood, but. Mm to hear their engagement of that conversation. And and for our listeners, Jordan Peele is featured heavily in it. He he speaks and is referenced multiple times. Um so no, it's 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 good stuff. Yeah. No, I totally agree. So yeah, I would highly recommend uh be it free trial or even pay for a month uh for Shudder, especially if you uh have grown to appreciate some of the films we talk about here. It's a good access yes. point for some of this genre it's material. Five dollars just... for a month. You can, I mean, that's the price of a rental. It's five dollars for a month of Shutter. So, by all means, yes, it's worth it. So, yeah, check that out. But regardless, that has been another installment of What You Watching, <laughs> What You Reading. Oh my gosh! God, what is the tune to Shallow? Oh, I can't get it in the moment. What are you? Uh, yeah. uh, forget it. <laughs> what you listening to? Listening to. I'm considering Lady leaving Gaga. all of that that just happened in, like all of your just like <laughs> you're just wandering Not around what? trying to find Lady Gaga. Your uh, inner no. Lady Gaga. Um, yeah. So uh, Gaga died. But before we get into, so we really need to step it along. But before we get into the uh, the film proper that we're talking about, we have another installment of hashtag TV guideposts to briefly tag in. We are covering over the course of the next ten weeks. We are covering one episode at a time. Time, the Haunting of Hill House, another Netflix original series, um, directed all 10 episodes by Mike Flanagan, uh, adapted from the book by Shirley Jackson. And in the last two episodes, we covered an episode each of The Haunting of Hill House. Now we are at episode three. So we're going to briefly breeze through some likes, dislikes, and scares. And uh, we are building up, after covering all of the main episodes, to a full conversation about The Haunting of Hill House uh, sometime probably next month. But, um, so here we are at episode three. This is the episode that focuses entirely on Theo. And you had referenced something, I think, in our very first episode conversation about it, about her uh, sort of mutant ability, if we want to call it that. This episode is called Touch, and it dives specifically into her clairvoyance and her her sort of psychic ability that she has when she touches people. Diving into this, I mean, I'm going to ask with a somewhat leading question, diving into this more exploratory episode focused on her, did you feel any differently about that, or do you still kind of not buy into that element of her character? Well, to be fair to this to this conversation, I did reference that in the first uh, Hill House episode discussion we had, but then <laughs> we cut that out. So, oh, that yes, is funny. I did. That is funny. Yeah, I forgot yeah. that I cut it out. I, no, that's okay. Two weeks ago, I made this note about uh, Theo's empathic abilities, um, and but because it hadn't appeared in this show yet, we decided to cut it out uh, in the edit. However, um, you know. I, I, it's one of those things I choose to buy because it's what the show gives me and there's so little to it. Um, between like, neutral, and dislike, it maybe is one of the only things in the entire series I'm just kind of neutral on. Sure. Uh, everything else I either like or love. Mm. Um, I just, I think for a show that's examining a very particular version of supernatural storytelling, it is the only thing outside of the ghosts and the haunting that is very unique and specific. Um, I was a bit more sympathetic to it because of the conversation that Liv, the mother, has with her. Mm. But it is it is such a deliberate choice that feels a little odd overall. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in the long run, it doesn't bother me. But it feels like the storyline that plays out in this one with the little girl she's treating 
Right, um, right. Is sort of a backdoor pilot to the adventures of Theo in CSI, you know, <laughs> um, where she just helps police <laughs> with cases, um, she, whispering to the ghosts. Of she her. just shakes the hands of all of the witnesses. <laughs> right, right, right. Sees who's lying. It's, it's very, it's very short episodes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like ten minutes. Uh, well, that guy. And I will say that, like, and I actively kind of resisted this thought, but this is the way I feel about it. I feel like the the abusive foster parents plot line that sort of unpacks her ability. Um, there are uh-huh. moments in it that are quite resonant, but I feel like it, 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 it felt a bit cliched. It felt a bit easy and automatic. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's a, it's a minor ding on, you know, the overall episode. Obviously there's still a lot of merit in, to what's happening, but, um, but yeah, I just felt like, Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the easy path to you know exploring what she does and how she does it that hasn't been said the scene where she's in the the foster girls uh like yeah. downstairs that's yeah. that's gut-wrenching yeah it's, that's intense yeah it's, well let me ask you like do you and i don't need it to by any means um i can be a person of agency and have my own opinion <laughs> um but <laughs> no i won't let you do do like does 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 her having this sort of ability ping for you at all in terms of a like huh question mark no or is it just like ah this is just part of the story no it it, it it is just sort of organic to the story the fact that her mother has a minor well i don't know how minor it is because her mother is in the story so uh right. confinedly but you know the fact that her mother shares this ability is something that normalizes it for me in the context of this story and so yeah i mean i it, it doesn't really bother me as a as a character condition and because we're already dealing with the supernatural it doesn't hurt the believability of the remainder or the you know sort of surrounding elements yeah. either um i th- i think it would feel somewhat out of place if this was you know just a straightforward family drama with you know family histories and no sure. no other supernatural element but then just this one child has this clairvoyant ability i'd be like that feels asynchronous but in a show like this it really doesn't uh in fact you would almost uh, imagine that one of them would. And I can't remember if it was, because the, the book is dramatically different and I have not reread it in some years, but I think one of the characters, and it might even be Theo's character in the novel, is a clairvoyant, is a psychic. Um, well, that would actually help me a little more to know it's kind of sourced from the original material. Just because, and again, it, it like... Ultimately, like I said, it's more of a neutral than a dislike. Sure. It it's just it feels very, you know, a bunch of humans plagued by spirits and then this one human who has a supernatural component to her sort of being. Sure. Um, so sure. it does it, it kind of stands out in that regard. Though as a pure like technical note, we've alluded a little bit to kind of the Netflix version of TV over the time our time on the show and I feel like for all of the positive Netflix brings in terms of new content and I mean, it's not really in question anymore that they've kind of reshaped the, you know, film and television industry. Sure. Um, right, I mean, right. ro- uh, 10 minutes ago, we're talking about Roma, which was, is about to probably win best picture. Right. Like mm-hmm. the game, the game has changed. The conversation is done in terms of its relevance. Netflix's relevance. That said, I, uh, this particular episode, a little less than next week's episode, which features Luke, I am so loving revisiting the show yeah, that yeah. it disappoints me. It, it further, it further reinforces to me the pitfalls of the Netflix TV model. And what mm-hmm. I mean by that is the TV model for Netflix for good or ill encourages binging. Yeah. What what binging discourages is thoughtful consideration and examining puzzle pieces. Think about a show like Lost, which yes, is kind of the tip of the iceberg in terms of quality of this kind of storytelling, but I don't know that if I had sat and barreled through an entire season of Lost every season, would I have gotten the same level of engagement and experience i think the themes overall i would have still thoroughly enjoyed and liked the characters but there's something about actually taking the 
toys out of the box one by one, examining them, pondering them, meditating on them. That is a much more fruitful way to engage and consume, I think, art. And hey, we'll get to something about art in this movie. Uh-huh, but yeah. you know, you know what I mean. I don't know if that makes any yeah, sense. Well, I'm, d- just enjo- I'm, I'm enjoying the experience rewatching it one by one far more. Right. Right. Than I did blazing through it. And I really enjoyed blazing through no, it. No, I've no, of course. Of course I enjoy. Well, uh, so here's what's ironic about what you just said. I I am not in the, you know, I don't have my finger on the pulse of the entertainment world. Um, but among my friends and among some rudimentary articles and things that I've uh scoured in the past, while yes, those of us who watched it in its original run had that experienced with Lost. I think Lost is largely credited as being one of the TV shows that started the binge desire phenomenon that where if you had TV seasons of DVD that you would borrow or opportunity to stream it, that to catch up for the new season, you would just barrel through them in a weekend. I know I know that happened with multiple uh, a sure. multitude of my friends who we would tell about the show and then they would go and then they would just consume it. Now, where I agree with you is I agree that if you watched a show like Lost week on week, you did get a different level of engagement because you're reading the clues, you're connecting the dots, you're thinking back to all these different things and you just have some different digestion time. But right. I just thought it was ironic that you mentioned Lost in, compar- in, in you know comparison to the Netflix model because you, you, I mean, lost was largely considered. I may be mistaken. Please listeners. If you have definitive proof, otherwise show it to me. I think lost is called the first absolute binge worthy show that it was the, the first one of its kind, uh, to hit network TV that then people were like, no, go buy the seasons, consume them all in a week and then come catch up. The only one that really stands out to me as a counterpoint to that would be 24, but that's not the point. Uh, 24 is a good point. Yeah. Um, I think, and hey, hey, buddy, our third episode into 2019, we're talking about Lost. Um, <laughs> so we didn't make it very far into the year without doing this. But it, these are difficult to compare because so much of them is alike. But the models that birth them are dramatically different. Oh, and that's all true. I mean, yeah. All I mean by that is Lost and Hill House have a lot in common. Uh, in terms of the way they tell their story. Sure, that's um, true. Mm-hmm. That said, Lost, and I'm sure Lindelof and Cuse would have said, was it a benefit or was it a curse one day to the next, had the benefit slash curse of longer seasons. It's funny, I would wonder, and and this really isn't an episode about Lost, but we're always game for that conversation. I would wonder about people's, reaction to the end of lost who binged it versus who were with it for a long time only because i think this is the binge setback like a model of show that encourages or has people binging means you're plowing quickly that the rubber band is going to snap back harder depending on what you feel by the end because if you had people this is purely just theorizing if you had people been binging lost very quickly and then, anyway, I would just be curious what the ratio of those who kind of mulled it over a long period of time and thus kind of enjoyed that experience and yeah. were a little more softer towards the end and or really loved the end well, versus people who binged it very quickly. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go no, ahead. no, no, no. I, well, I apologize for cutting you off. The main reason that I did it, acknowledging its rudeness and apologizing for it is we need to get back to Hill House so we can get to our main film. But... I will say that, like, if you would just poll a room of people who watched the finale that was, of Lost, that was really that was a really rude. Read, I, yeah, I figured. Yeah, <laughs> if you just polled a room of the people who watched the finale of Lost, and in the room where we watched it, there were maybe twenty people, um, and they had all varieties: people who had binged the show over the course of a couple of weeks that loved the finale, people who had been with it from episode one that hated the finale, and vice versa. And so I don't know. I I don't have definitive data, but I have talked to a bizarre variety of people who loved and hated it for their own reasons. But I do feel like to sort of attempt to close the loop on the binge model conversation. The problem right now is that in a streaming world, um, network may be the way you engage with 
broadcast television, but eventually it's all going to be binged because eventually it's all going to hit a streaming platform. Even Hulu, which refrains from releasing all of its episodes at once, releases once a week, but then they're all there. Then they're all available. Well, sure. And so, yeah, yeah. so it's like the, at that point, the choice is basically yours if you want to do what we're doing and parse out an episode at a time or if you want to you know, just plow through it. And I do think there are benefits and setbacks to both. Um, yes, but a last note on that is the architecture, though, is different. Um, yes, ultimately, a thing may, you know, we may hit this inflection point where everything on the planet that's consumable is all consumable at one time and we'll all die from overeating. <laughs> but, um, you know, of, of the uh, uh, entertainment sort, well, it's Wally, you know, we're all edit- headed for Wally. Yeah. Um, so regardless, all I'm trying to say in a very long winded way of doing so between the two of us is I'm so enjoying the rewatch in a more methodical fashion, even though I really liked the initial beat. Sure, um, sure, sure. So, um, yeah, I'm ambivalent about Theo's Im- mutant abilities, though. I like Theo. I like all the characters. Yeah. Um, um, some scares. This show, this episode's got some really good scares. Oh my gosh, one of my favorites. Um, I will lead, although I might be stealing yours. And I apologize. That's no, okay. Luke and Luke in the basement is probably a top five of that series. Yeah, I, I'll ditto that. That is on my list. It's number one on my list. And yeah, it's it. Luke getting taking the dumb waiter down to the basement is one of the freakiest things that show delivers. It's incredible. Well, and we talked about compositions, uh, you know, visual composition two weeks ago. To me. I don't know if you'd feel this way. The editing of that scene is is what yes. enhances its fear. Oh, because absolutely. That, that hand or not, you're like, what did I just see? Mm-hmm. But it cuts away from it, and it's just on Luke while he's yeah. freaking out. And you're like, okay, the brilliance of that. And I'm sure there are, there are cinephiles or, or academicians, academicians? Cinema <laughs> academics out there who could verify this. What's the power of that scene in that edit is Luke is looking at us, which means we're nervous about what is behind him. Mm-hmm. Or, or I'm sorry, we're nervous about what's behind us. You know right, what I mean? Like, right, right, right. We know something's out there. Yes. And it's, by oh. by perspective, behind us, which is freaky. And he does a clever thing by only showing it for maybe a second and a half. So the yeah. flashlight like hits yeah. it, and then it goes goes dark again. And that is brilliant, because... You're not quite sure what you saw, but you know you saw something, and it seemed to have a head, but did it or not? I don't know, and yes, it's very, very scary. What's a, is there, is, do you have another specific I have one more, one more scare to share, and that is basically just Mr. Smiley at the yes. edge of Theo's bed. <laughs> it is so alarming when she, or she jumps up and oh, sees that. Oh, um, It's so alarming. So yeah, that that is really really nerve wracking. I have just uh, one more uh, sort of like dislike I'll mention. I have a dislike and then a, a like, and then uh, then I, that's all my notes for this one. So I will say that while I don't have a problem with Theo's psychic ability, her her lover plot line, I ha- it stretches my believability only because I wonder if somebody like that would really keep coming back to her the way that Theo treats her. Theo treats her so poorly. And yeah. it just stretches yeah, my body. I don't totally disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that uh, that I wanted to mention was just, um, I, I do, you know, kind of lumps in the throat when she confesses to Shirley that she's furious at Nell for having killed herself. Um, yeah. But her reaction after touching Nell uh, I don't quite know yeah. where to put this, but well, this probably belongs in scares because I feel like that's one of the most horrifying moments in the whole show, and there's no musical manipulation. It's it's pure performance, but her reaction when she touches Nell is just like you, your your brain starts going like, what did she see? What was that that freaked her out so bad? I don't understand. And yeah, well, and that is the brilliance of the moment is up till now you've gotten hints at least of what she's seen because she acts on it in a certain way. Right. So you're really, you're really just left in the dark, uh, which is itself a level of terrifying. I don't think it's this episode. I think it's the Shirley episode, but I do love the conversation between Theo and Shirley on the bed when Shirley's pondering how to tell her kids about Nell's death. It's yeah, it's touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you just, 
you tell the truth. Yes, is that the and one? She says, yeah. "Yeah, just tell them you don't know." And uh, and and she says, "I'm so glad they won't ask me because I'm just so angry. I'm so I'm so mad." Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, although she does say, and she confesses it to her lover, where she does say, she says, talking about the girl that she helped rescue from the foster family, she says right. she just needed help and no one was listening. And I yep. I love how in that moment. She's talking about that girl, but she's also talking about Nell, and I find that yep. heartbreaking and beautiful. And yeah, it's yeah, it's wonderful. It's yeah, this is a something of a lesser episode in terms of my raw passion for it, but still, like every episode in this series, lots of great things to point out. Yes. Uh, so hashtag TV guide pose. That is yeah. episode three of the Haunting of Hill House. Next week we will be discussing episode four, which is called A Twin Thing, mm-hmm. featuring. Maybe my favorite character of the series, Luke. Oh, that's um, awesome. All right. So, shall we yeah. Shall we read? Shall we sally forth Let's into the art it. world? <laughs> uh, yeah. So this film uh, and our coverage for it, this was one of those rare moments where you and I kind of had a conversation about um, we're going to dive into something and we chose to cover it not having seen it. Just we were doing this series, we wanted to sort of uh, surprise ourselves and have uh, a piece that neither of us were very familiar with and just sort of enjoy the experience together. We d- we've done that a couple of times on the show. Uh, we did that with Mother. Uh, I, you know, Quiet Place was pretty, uh, pretty fresh for both of us. But what was your basic feelings about... You know, I have just like one or two little trivial notes, but what, was your ba- what were your basic feelings about Velvet Buzzsaw coming out of it. Uh, well, it's funny. You, uh, I feel like you just were very courteous just then and not throwing me under the bus. <laughs> well, no, of course. <laughs> I know, I know. So I joke about how I trust Reed when he chooses older films, you know, that, that are, that, that, you know, have stood the test of time in the horror genre that I'm just unfamiliar with. And then the one time I'm like, Hey, Reed, this has just come out. Uh, let's watch it. I like Jake Gyllenhaal. Let's check it out. <laughs> um, so I, I, it's Netflix. I contended hard for Velvet Buzzsaw and if I'm perfectly honest, was very untaken with it. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, there are things, there's conversation that will be had, but in terms of my energy, this is terrible read. Like that's not me assessing the movie. No, of course. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I watched it with Stephen Hairgrove. Shout out Stephen, uh, who's been referenced once or twice over the life of the show. And, if not for company, if not for the show, I might have turned it off. Oh, I was, wow. I was that wow. just kind of like, blah. Just disinterested. Like, mm. Well, it, I don't know. You have these pieces of media you watch sometimes where the first 15 minutes will be such a good indication of flavor. Sure. Yeah. That yeah. You, you sort of recognize, oh, it's never really going to deviate from this particular flavor that has already established. Sure. And I was just kind of relatively out on the flavor I was getting after 15 minutes. Gotcha. That I just gotcha. was like, oh, and it, uh, anyway, so. Interesting. Yeah. I, yeah. No, that's all right. So, that's all right. <laughs> no, no, were you, bad. were you kind of, uh, were you are you are you in on the Velvet Bus Saw? I'm I'm a little in on the Velvet Bus Saw. I did, really yeah. So here's the thing. I did not uh, obviously Dan Gilroy, the 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 trio of Dan Gilroy, Renee Russo, and Jake Gyllenhaal uh, previously paired for Nightcrawler, which is an electric, yeah, which is m- I love it, mesmerizing yeah. film. And so I I kind of you know you go in with that pedigree. Uh, that's certainly a lot to live up to. But there is something about the way that I approach streaming content in general. I will say this. I lean a bit more complimentary towards direct to streaming content. I don't know why. Um, I think it probably part of it is just sort of, you know, the weight of expectation. It's just, it's available to me. I don't have a ton of hype surrounding, you know, whether or not I'm going to enjoy this or not. I'm just going to take what the film gives me and see uh, how I feel about that. So, but I definitely recognized uh, some of its flaws. Um, some of them I'll I'll mention. But I, yeah, I was I, I I kind of enjoyed it. I kind of enjoyed it quite a bit. And when we get into theme, for about the last forty five minutes of the movie, something really began to ping in in my heart that 
I will further unpack when we get to that point of it. But uh, but yeah, I did. I, I, I liked it quite a bit. It's not the type of film that I would champion and be like, oh my gosh, please rush to Netflix right now and see Velvet Buzzsaw. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to be pretty, I think I'm going to be pretty favorable towards it. Um, d- wow. so one bit of, one bit of trivia and then maybe we can get into some of those likes, dislikes. I don't know. Well, I don't know how much, uh, post watching research you did, but I didn't pick up on this until after the fact. And I read this in, in a little trivial, uh, excursion where it said that, uh, most of the people who are killed are killed by a piece of art or a work of art that they actively show contempt for in the film. And I thought that was really interesting. So um, the uh, the character, uh, obviously, well, huge spoilers for Velvet Buzzsaw. It's on Netflix. Nathan didn't care for it. I kind of liked it. Uh, so take that for what you will. Here come spoilers. So like Jake Gyllenhaal dies by the hand of that robo, you know, hobo man. Hobo man. And then uh, Rene Russo dies by the Velvet Buzzsaw tattoo that's on right, her neck, which right. she says she regretted. The uh, Tony Collette's character dies by that sphere, which she kind of scoffs at when she sees it for the first time. Um, so I, I, I think with the exception of the, the everyman worker who drives the truck and then the art just sort of all yeah, attacks him, right. I think with the exception of him, they all die by a piece of art that, that through the course of the film they've actively expressed contempt for, which I found interesting. Uh, I, you know, I don't have much to say about that, but I just thought that was that was kind of interesting. For the the only other piece of trivia that I have is that for a film that feels like it was somewhat, um, I won't say the film feels thrown together, but it does feel very spontaneous. Uh, it doesn't feel like it had been gestating in Gilroy's mind for very long. It it appears from some of the interviews I've read that he put a ton of thought into this particular story and that there was a, a tremendous amount of research into the art world, a tremendous amount of sort of intentional uh, thematic uh, exploration that he was trying to unpack, which, which again, I, I, I found interesting, and maybe some of which I tapped into with some of my thoughts. But um, yeah, that's... well, yes, and in fact, I didn't do a ton after watch research, but honestly, what tipped me over to to campaign for us to cover it was listening to an interview with him. Oh, and really? I interesting. Like, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I heard him interview, and I was like, oh, I want to check that out even more now. I, I am a just a avowed Jake Gyllenhaal fan. You know, yay Mysterio. Um, <laughs> I, I do enjoy Nightcrawler. I love Enemy. You know, like I've just written Donnie Darko. You and I watched together almost probably 20 years ago. Yeah, this point. yeah. Like, I, I, I really enjoy the guy. And so he is a draw for me regardless. I think I don't mind... I'll I'll say my my sort of critical statements so we if it's okay that we can yeah. sort of consider this slice slice dislikes um that are going to sound super harsh I don't feel passionately about them mm. but there were moments where I was like this feels like an X file without Scully and Mulder it just has this mm. kind of like USA movie kind of like because I don't disagree with you like I I, I think. Dan Gilroy is talented and, and I love, he's a big names guy, which I'm a fan of. Um, you know, these, the name, I mean, friggin Gyllenhaal's character's name is Morph Vanderwalt. Like, <laughs> what a great name. We, we joked yeah. at the top of the episode about John Don Don. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rodora. I think it just, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think production wise is my biggest beef with the movie. It doesn't feel like, it does feel a little slapdash, even though you have Tony Collette, Jake Gyllenhaal, Rene Russo, mm-hmm. John Malkovich. You know, it it just feels a little slapdash. Gotcha. I don't know. I don't know. It felt it felt about as surfacey as some of the characters it was portraying. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which which hear me like I, I I'm not like I don't like hate the film. I, I don't want it to come off that way. I just am so like meh about it yeah um i can understand and i i I didn't think it was scary um Mm. you know it it it, again it just had that kind of like late 90s catch it on cable tv kind of feel to it um in a way that was a little disappointing for how much i had talked myself into hopefully liking it gotcha well and i don't disagree with the with your description of the tone um, I actually, that's part of what I kind of liked about it. Like, uh, when you said X-Files, I didn't think of it 
while I was watching the film, but looking back on it, I'm like, yeah, it does. It does kind of has that sort of uh, like an X-Files type of vibe. Um, but I think that was part of what endeared me to it. I wasn't really looking for nightmares out of it, but it, it was something that I do think, uh, yeah, I, 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 I kind of agree with your description of the tone. I just think um, it, it, it's a little bit more uh, interested in, how should I put this? Uh, I think it's interested in quirks and it tries to evoke a particular style that uh, maybe doesn't quite cohere to the degree that Gilroy wanted it to. I do, I do kind of like, in my likes, dislikes, I do kind of like the quirky characterizations of all the people. Each of the people sure. feel very distinct. Um, when a character speaks, they do not sound like every other character, and I liked that about it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously there's some very outlandish characterizations, particularly from, like, Tony Collette plays a character named Gretchen, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal himself, uh, even Rene Russo, who's, you know, kind of one of the most straightforward of that bunch. Th- there's still some distinction in how they, how their language is crafted, um, how they carry themselves. And so I, I kind of appreciated that. I will say... Yeah, I- Go ahead. I agree. Script, I agree. Scripting wise, it's strong. If if I have an ultimate beef with it, it's just production wise feels pretty weak. Go ahead. Sure. Sure. Sorry, no. 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 I understand that. Um, I will say, and I'm going to save some of this for uh, thematic stuff. But the character of Pierce, probably Pierce or Piers Malkovich. Malkovich's character. Yeah. 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 He's um, great. His and his, not only does he really bring it to the scenes that he's in, but his character's arc might be responsible for half of my star rating on this film. Um, I can see that. Because some of what they do with him... Uh, Remind me, where does the film leave him? Is he just out of the picture? The The film leaves him with him being encouraged by Redora to... Like, when she comes to his uh, studio and sees what uh-huh. he's been working on, right, she right. basically tells... Oh, my gosh. Like, you're going to force me to get into theme right here, which honestly, like, I don't mind if we just do that because it's, it's long. We can breeze back into scares uh, in a minute. But th- she says to him, she says, you need to get away and do something for yourself. And where, so that's the last scene in the film that we see him. But right, as the right. credits begin to roll, then we see him. That's right. Yes, we I did see love him this. Drawing yes. in the sand as the tide the continues beach. to yep. to come in. Yep. Um, and I have a lot to say about that scene. Yeah. So that that's basically the arc that he goes through. He's struggling. He's he's sober now. And they even make a comment very early in the film where where they say, "Yes, sobriety has not been kind to him, or good for him." I think uh, I think Gyllenhaal's character says that sobriety has not been good for him. And so then when John Dondon, <laughs> fun name to say, <laughs> shows up and is like, okay, I'm ready to sell everything you've got. And he sees a solitary yeah, piece, yeah. one piece up there. And Malkovich is like shooting basketball while he's watching the guy. And you see it in Malkovich's face too, where he's like, I, you know, this, this is what I'm up against. All down in the basement, they're making tons of replicas and go, revisiting old wells for previous work. And up here, it, it's it's shallow and it's empty and I can't and I can't do anything. And you know, Don Don obviously is like, "Okay, okay." You know, and just sort of doesn't know how to compute that. Right, right, right. But then I loved that when Redora, Renee Russo's character, sees that, that's the advice she gives to him. And she gives it to him in very much like a friend to a friend, not a an art dealer to an artist. She very much tells him like you need to you need to get away, you know, and you need to just and, you know do this. And as a brief as a brief note, because we haven't explicitly done this, the loose summary of the movie, sure, uh, as sure. we just alluded, uh, Rene Russo's character is an art dealer. She has a gallery. Malkovich is an artist who's been very successful uh, previously. Um, Gillen Hall is the critic. Um, uh, Tony Collette. Uh, is a, an aspiring um, sort of, I guess, an aspiring dealer, right? Yeah, you know, kind of like kind a of freelancer the, in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's kind of just all about this world of art and commerce and what is valuable from an artistic standpoint, thus what becomes valuable from a monetary standpoint. So it got it. I I am not going to disagree with any sort of uh, read, <laughs> especially <laughs> read, um, of the film. That's like no, it's it's got some interesting things. It's having a conversation about um again production wise left me a little lackluster but 
I will say, I don't want to pivot you too far away from theme, so I want to I want to hang there. But I will say one of my absolute favorite things about this movie is that someone uses the word ensorcelled. <laughs> and I was like, that yes. is an amazing, yes. amazing word. I do know uh, you love for, the words. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. For followers along at home, it means to bewitch. Um, <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal. So, so oh, that was a, that's a big puzzle piece I left out in terms of summary. Um, kind of a low-key player in the story stumbles upon this treasure trove of an artist's work that yes. then starts yes. to kind of haunt and attack uh through kind of mystical means um other characters in it well gyllenhaal while observing one of these pieces while looking into the camera um says i am ensorcelled yeah i was like you go buddy me too (laughs) well and yeah that's an important distinction because the the art the artist um that they discover this character that we haven't mentioned yet ironically named josephina she is uh, is perpetually sort of poor time management. She's late. She works for Redora. Redora demotes her and then ultimately just basically fires her. Um, but then uh, Josefina sort of wins her way back by discovering the art of this man that lived in her apartment building. And this man had left instructions for all of his art to be destroyed. But Josefina breaks into his to his apartment. I can't remember if she breaks in or sneaks in, but she gets into his apartment and steals all of that art so that it is not destroyed. Um, they then discover, because this is a horror film, that uh, some of the paint that was used appears to actually be human blood, presumably, possibly, the artist's own blood. And then, uh, as the characters begin to become ensorcelled with the artist's work, um, then they find that not only his art but other pieces of art begin to come alive and and attack them as it were which does sound a bit silly sort of when you break the premise down like that there's there's a little bit more artfulness to it than that but um getting back to what i was sort of scratching at with theme um if you're okay with that do you mind if we just sort of yeah no, sort of I'm, camp I'm there good. for a second I'm good um so one of the things that th- there are three quotes from the film that i'm going to reference so please forgive me listeners and forgive me co-host i'm gonna i'm gonna go for a minute go um so there's a line where uh Mal- where gyllenhaal's character is trying to talk to redora renee russo's character and he's trying to warn her that he is having hallucinations and when he says that he says, you know, something is going on here. And then she says, all art is dangerous. Mm-hmm. And, I wrote that down. And then there's a, there's a moment earlier in the film, I think it's very early in the film, that something stood out to me where he himself, who, as you mentioned, is an art critic, Gyllenhaal says, I think in that opening art gallery, I think he almost mumbles to himself, critique is so limiting and emotionally draining. And I was mm-hmm. like, I that down mm. too. oh, see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then uh, there's one other thing, one other quote that I'm going to bring in, um, and it is when uh, Josephina is desperately trying to get another artist named Damrish to not leave Rodora's sort of art dealership fold. She's trying to urge him not to leave, and she says, um, "What does art mean if it can't be seen?" And mm-hmm. that. That was when, the, like, it's not quite the... Well, and, and actually, uh, Reed, if I can interject, the literal line sure. is, what's the point of art if nobody sees it? Oh, okay, yes, okay. So, yes. yeah, because I couldn't, I couldn't quite remember that quote, so I, didn't, so I had to just sort of go back after the fact. So, um, what is the point of art if nobody sees it? Well, I'm going to tell you about a Ray Bradbury short story, okay? There's a Ray Bradbury short story called Picasso Summer, and it's one of my probably five favorite Ray Bradbury short stories, and he had a multitude of them, and most of them are quite beautiful. But in Picasso Summer, there is a man who is disillusioned with his life, uh, strained in his marriage, wandering aimlessly through his middle years. And he is vacationing in Italy, wanders onto an obscure portion of the beach, and runs into Pablo Picasso himself, the legendary artist. And this man runs into Picasso drawing pictures Beautiful works of art in the sand. That's what he <laughs> sees Picasso doing. And then Picasso looks up at him, and they, they share a moment. It's been a while since I read the, the, the story, but they share a moment where basically Picasso kind of you know looks at him, acknowledges his presence, and then kind of in a sideways glance kind of way, 
you know, looks down at the art and, and basically, you know, asks what the guy thinks. He doesn't, they, they never exchange any words, but he's kind of like, yeah, what, you know, what do you think? What do you think of this? And the guy is just stunned. I mean, here is one of the, one of the premier legendary artists in the world drawing pictures in the sand and like, what do you say to that kind of thing? And he's just like, yeah, he's, he's captivated. He's mesmerized. But the way that story ends, the way Bradbury's story ends is the man is sitting at dinner across from his estranged wife and he's sitting there and he begins to become very emotional as he listens out the window. And when his wife asks him what's wrong, he says, nothing. I just hear the tide coming in. And oh, wow. it's, wow. it's powerful. It's powerful. Yeah. And so when I saw, and I don't know if Gilroy re- reads Bradbury, I don't know. I, I don't know how direct of a connection this was. But when I saw after being told by his former business partner and former you know, friend, it should appear to be, while being told, hey, you know, you don't need to go back to drinking. You just need to get away and do something for yourself. We see Piers, this artist who's trying to find his voice again, drawing pictures in the sand while the tide is there. He's literally fighting the yeah, tide yeah. to draw pictures in the sand. And it erupted in me, this conversation about the, this compulsion to create and this compulsion to produce and what we do for others to see it and what we do simply for the for the edification of our well-being and for the wholeness of ourself and how we operate in that. And Pierce is is probably the only aside from maybe Coco who's just sort of along for the ride with all these other things to bear witness to is it. Is that Nancy? That's Nancy, yeah. yeah. Nancy from Stranger Things. Um so but Pierce is the only one who dare I say not only survives the whole ordeal but has a legitimately I would call that a happy ending. I would absolutely yeah, call yeah, his yeah. landing point a a happy one, and it just I, again I don't I have not listened to interviews with Gilroy. I read one sort of brief article with a couple of soundbite quotes, but it really stood out to me about this this statement of yeah when you produce for the sake of the machine for the sake of the commerce th- that is a, sort of a consumptive thing. It will eventually be sort of your undoing. But you find your voice again when you just sort of get back to, hey, I just enjoy making art. And I enjoy, right, I enjoy, right. like, he's literally playing in the sand, Nathan. He's literally, yep, like, yep, a yep. kid's sandbox is the image, and he's literally playing around in it. It will be gone the next day because of gravity and the tides of the ocean. And it was, I, it struck me as so beautiful. It really connected with me. And I would probably, again, as I said earlier, give maybe half of my eventual star rating to the uh, admittedly brief moment of this film, but I think crucial uh, because it, it is what we see over the credits. It is Gilroy's right. choice. Yeah, it's a final statement. Yes, yeah, it's yeah. what we are meant to be left with on this film. Um, so I don't think it's, it's throwaway. Um, well, yeah. Anyway. No, no, no. I, I would, I would agree with that. Um, in the interview I heard with him, he doesn't reference that end point specifically, more production, you know, general production ideas. But he does talk at, at length about how fascinated he became with the art industry, mm-hmm. and, and he, it's real specific to talk about this. And our takeaways are similar, though. Though, while it subconsciously pinged for me, the the Malkovich finale did was more revelatory for you uh, consciously um but nonetheless I am on board with where you're going there and there's something that so there's there's various strains I'm going to try to pull together here but I had the thought a couple of years ago or at least wrote down the thought of how critical our culture is and and the difference between criticism and creation mm. and there is a limitless uh, volume of criticism to be found mm-hmm. in our society, in our culture, especially in the amplification age of social media. There is a limited, I think, volume of creating. And I think, you know, I, I would much rather, although I, you know, like so many, I would probably fall more into the critic than the creator often, but I'm much more interested in participating in that creation experience Mm. than i am in 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 formulating critique necessarily because uh, it's funny i I wrote down all the quotes you had you (laughs) you just got you you got you got more energized by them than i did but (laughs) um but i do think again on paper on script there's a fascinating conversation about like 
the commodification of creativity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, Malkovich is, has been, because he is the aged artist in this story, um, and has been thus kind of, um, bullied is the wrong word, but he's been buffeted through the years by the experience he's had just in this industry, right? Right, right. Of uh, his art being a commodity. Um, sure. and, and the expectation of productivity and the degree to which, because it's him, right? Who is it his stuff that basically Redora gets a tip and Jillian Hall provides the critique and suddenly it elevates and, or maybe it's just generally speaking, she's kind of making that happen. But hmm. regardless, Malkovich is kind of buffeted by this industry over the years and is finally kind of a pulp by the end of it hmm. um, until he's encouraged to go draw in the sand as it were yeah and yeah. I, I think honestly my final thought read in terms of piggybacking on where you're at you identify something and i want us to play here if <laughs> we can <laughs> i think didn't you did you use the word play a minute ago yeah yeah, yeah you did. just playing in the sand yeah there have been i can point to two two experiences that manifest in two moments over the last like decade and i remember telling my wife about this now, I am not a, uh, I like to think I've got some artistic kind of sensibilities and, and creative sensibilities. I'm not by any means uh, the, the level of accomplished of the characters in this story. Mm -hmm. But the notion have, of play has really sung out to me in my late 30s and having children. I've thought about this recently. Like your kids who are able to just like fart around and, and, just just tool around and play with this and play with that and not and and how demanded we feel uh, on our time and on yeah. our person you know and i remember two years ago my family that does this beach trip uh listen to the jaws episode <laughs> last summer um <laughs> for a little more detail i intentionally got a bunch of sand castle like just tools sure you know, yeah, little, yeah 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 uh some some a little more elaborate than just your pl tiny plasticky thing and dude i can't tell you what it was like i didn't draw in the sand like malkovich but with my kids just literally sitting there and digging in the sand mm -hmm. for hours mm -hmm. and the and and i'm and i'm championing this experience as something to how on earth do we figure out how to cultivate this in our not in our day-to-day -day lives, I, I, I'm desperate to know that, um, of this experience of there is no external pressure. There is only this moment of play, of, yeah. of abandon. Um, it's not intellectual property themed. It's not work adjacent. It's not familiar territory. It is just sitting in this place and just play and just like, mm -hmm. In that in that particular scenario, playing in sand, as you rightly pointed out, that you even subconscious and maybe consciously know this is going to get washed away in yeah. ten hours. But yeah. but I am present, and I don't know. I had a really profound experience doing that a couple of years ago. And the other one that occasionally will happen for me, where this manifests, is as maybe weird as it sounds, is putting together Legos. Yeah, like oh yeah, I yeah. can get so wrapped up the few times I've had. Um, a dedicated kind of Lego set that's like mine or, or a personal one that I've like, oh, I've, you know, I've got a Star Wars piece that a couple of years ago <laughs> I was late to bed and my wife came downstairs <laughs> and I'm putting together the Lego yeah, thing. And she's yeah. like, are you really down here? I was like, I'm so swept up in this thing right now. Just like, don't even bother me. <laughs> uh, I've got my tunes playing in the background. There's no, there's no critic waiting at the end of this process. Right, there's no, right. there's no income being produced or not, right, uh, right. depending on how this goes. It is literally just the act of play and it, and what a joy that is and how difficult that is to cultivate in a routine life. It really is. And I'll go one step further and say that like even some of what we would define as play uh, there's, there's a difference between like competitive play and, yeah. and creative yep. play. Like I'm thinking Correct. about, 
even even something like you and I coined a phrase when we were, you know, playing Mario Kart or more specifically when you were pretending to play wrestling video games with me. <laughs> um, when we would uh, so like we established something called uh, video game Tourette syndrome where we would get really like we'd get angry at wanting to accomplish a thing and not be able to accomplish it. Then you want to throw your remote across the room. And then there's another phrase that we would have where you and I would sit down and specifically we would do this playing Mario Kart because unlike wrestling where I would, you know, strive with everything in me. <laughs> and, and so, you know, wrestling would produce video game Tourette's syndrome in me. But what Mario Kart would do for us is we called it, you know, Mario Kart therapy, where basically we would sit down, we would just talk life, you know, we would go around in, in the little circles at Mario Kart. But my, the point in the distinction between like something like that and what we're describing both in John Malkovich drawing in the sand and you with your experience making the sandcastles is there's a difference when competition is at is at work versus yes. you know sort of this burst of oh look at this thing that I did isn't this isn't this cool like look at this you know like one of my favorite things to watch my son do is when he will get just get this burst of I want to draw something or I want to write yeah, some stuff yeah. down and so he'll just grab paper frenetically and usually will not use the paper that we have purchased on pads for him but rather wants to use the, <laughs> the printer paper or whatever but he just wants to get these these drawings and he just wants to he 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 just wants to go with it he's got it in his mind he wants to put it down on paper and and it's funny because this film really did make me kind of reflective not even just in the sense of creativity and what we output but just how frequently i've talked before about sometimes you and i do this you and i do this podcast and occasionally we will watch a film and while we're watching the film i don't i don't want to speak for you but while we're watching the film if we know we're going to talk about it then i've got a catalog okay well how do i encapsulate my thoughts on this film how do i right, you know right. how do i do this how do i watch this movie what am i going to say what does this mean what is and to quote freaking velvet buzzsaw critique is so limiting and emotionally draining and yep. and so then versus Versus this this past weekend, so at, at work, um, I don't know how many of my work peeps listen to the podcast, but um, shout out to you, Movie Club, if you're there. What up, work peeps? <laughs> um, at work, we started a movie club, and basically, uh, we watch, we, we get together on average, uh, we try to do once a week, but it's really turning into more like, you know, twice a month, where we just all agree, hey, we're all going to watch this movie, and then we're going to sit down at lunchtime and discuss the movie. And so the the movie on the table recently was Raiders of the Lost Ark, which a couple of people had never seen. And I was like, oh, it's the original Indiana Jones. And so, like, for the weekend, I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. Just, I'm going to sit down because I'm going to talk with my movie buddies about Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then I was like, you know what? I like Indiana Jones. It's been a long time since I've seen Temple of Doom. And then I just, I watched, I watched the whole series. Like I, watched, like, I watched Temple of Doom. And then I even went on to watch Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And so, oh, wow. but, but here's the thing is is like just this experience of, I don't, I don't have to report to anybody about this. Sure. Yep. I don't have yep. to, you know, like, yeah, we watched Raiders so that we could discuss it later, but like these other films are just like, I'm, I'm just watching them because it's been a while. And there's such a difference in my mind between what I intake just for the sake of taking it in and what I take in for the sake of parsing out through some sort of critical lens. And I definitely don't want this conversation to be heard as this like tear down of criticism. I really don't want that because I think there's a lot of value in critical thinking, critical thought, responses to the films. I think it challenges art to be better. But I do think there's something to be said for as a creative or, or doing, you know, if, some, if, if there are those of you who are sitting there listening to this and you're like, how can I, you know, how can I make this particular thing work to where it'll get all of the hits or to where it'll, you know, get all the listens or to where it'll, you know, make the big pop? I'm like, I don't know. Maybe there is really something to just, I'm just going to do the thing that is the audience of one. I'm just going to do the thing that 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 inspires me and that I'm galvanized by and that I enjoy and I'm I'm just going to participate in that and maybe that's our maybe that's our way back to that that fullness of realizing why we got started doing this in the first place um and well and yeah. I, I I will I'm sorry to jump in no, on there you're, but you're um, okay. I applaud your you know kind of softness there about criticism I I mean my goodness I'm an ardent and and encourager of, of critical thinking of course but i do think something that bears considering though 
is there's critical thinking and then there's a critical spirit. And I think mm. what can be treacherous terrain is under, and you and I, as the types of people we are, can be prone to this, or I'll speak for myself, can be prone to this, where what what I might defend on paper as, well, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just exercising my critical thinking, or I'm just, you know, being discerning, if you will, yeah. um, can... Yeah can tip over into well now everything is a is a merit based sort of right. perspective right. um which is a troubling thought I, so i just wanted to adjust that or asterisk that however it's really funny <laughs> There have been one or two times, and she probably is annoyed at me by now for when this happens, where if I'm, if my wife and I are present with someone who learns, uh, or like a peer who happens to learn in that particular conversation that I do a podcast and, and it is this, <laughs> she, and it's, it's, it makes sense. She's looking for the fewest words possible to convey what we do. Um, she's like, oh, they review horror movies. And it's so funny, Reed. I'll be like, no, we don't. <laughs> We don't do that. That's not what we do. We are not a review show. Oh, that's so <laughs> but it's funny. just so funny because it's like, no, <laughs> we're not here. We, we will we will speak in the language of criticism and review as part of it. Yeah, but that's not what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> but I know she's just like whatever. You, like you bra. know, it's it's the easiest way to convey it. Oh but my anyway, gosh, it's just really funny. Well, and. Yeah, and I I don't want to go unmentioned uh this so getting back to this idea of uh I'm I'm going to extrapolate something very briefly and then maybe we you know maybe we need to find a, a yeah. place to wind down. Um so Jalen Hall's character one of the first pieces of art he encounters is Hobo Man. Yep. Which is this like robotic figure. But Hobo Man's words uh, really robotic figure in the shape of a homeless person. Like yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, yeah. he's a, he's a robot, and he's even got like some pieces of his uh, fleshy exterior missing, so that it's very visible that he's a robot. But um, yeah, he's dressed up kind of like a homeless person, and his he has two lines. He says a couple of things, but he has two lines that really stood out to me. He says, "Have you ever?" I, I can't remember if he says, have you ever been invisible or have you ever felt invisible? Yeah, yeah. I actually didn't write that one down, but yes, I do remember the So line. he says, I, th I think it's felt. So have you ever felt yeah. invisible? And then he follows it up with this, and I, I can't, again, I just can't imagine that stuff like Malkovich's sand paintings at the end, and everything. I can't see it as accidental. Because then he says, have you ever felt invisible? And then he says, once I built a railroad. And... It was just the, the it seems so random when you hear it the first time, and it's actually the last thing that the that this robotic piece of art says before he takes Jill and Hall's life. But it's it's one of those things where he's like, "Once I built a railroad," and it's I don't know juxtaposing this idea of like, "Hey, I I built this thing once once I did this thing." with my hands, um, but it was following this compulsion or this question of, have you ever felt invisible? And I would venture to say there's something to be explored about the fact that Malkovich out there on the beach, he's, he's alone. I mean, we don't know how close he is to population, but he's alone on the beach, and therefore, at that moment, rather invisible. Just he himself building this thing, and I don't know, there is this big, massive thought strain that is that is bubbling up in my mind about this occasional compulsion. Maybe I can wrestle it in with a scripture. Maybe I can wrestle it in with a, with a Bible verse. So, I, was, I, go. I have thoughts on what you just said. Um, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. And I'm yeah. worried, but I'm worried my thoughts are going to derail your, your intent of your scriptures. So no, no, no. I've got that. Go no, first. I've got the scripture pulled up. So you go ahead and share your thoughts. I also, I also love that two weeks ago you said I'm not going to feel beholden to the show scripture every week. And you're well, no, well, no, um, because this, it just I know, popped I'm up. I'm playing. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. I'm playing with you. Um, the haters out there are going to be like, "See, Nathan doesn't like the Bible." <laughs> That's not at all <laughs> what the takeaway there. Um, I do. The, the the hobo man's line. Do you ever feel invisible? I once built a railroad, or uh, or how? What was once what I built say? a railroad. Once I built a railroad. So I think I think a I I feel like you're subconsciously touching on this, and I want to bring it to the fore um, in an attempt <laughs> while we try to bring this to an end. Mm -hmm. um, I think the value there and why Malkovich's scene should resonate even more for you than it already does, which is which is a lot. Hobo man is saying, 
I once did this thing, but it doesn't matter anymore. I did this thing as a commodity. I did this mm-hmm. thing for a societal purpose, mm-hmm. yeah. but I'm invisible yeah. because no one knows that I put my hand yeah. in this. I, yeah. am, I am nothing relevant to that railroad anymore. Yeah. I am invisible. Mm-hmm. So, And it's funny. This is pinging me now. The Gilroy interview, he does reference this. The value of art for the sake of the artist. Mm-hmm. And that is what is happening at the end. This is Malkovich playing creating with zero conscientiousness towards its impact on anyone other than him right, and right. his appreciation and affection of the beauty of the creative process. Yeah. Right. He, he, so I would, I would, I don't know that you were saying this, but it felt that way for a second. I don't think there's any invisibility in that moment for him whatsoever. It's mm. simply, I am doing this because I derive joy in the doing of it. No, I get that. A, yeah. a person's, its visibility to anyone is utterly moot and irrelevant to me. Um, I don't know. That's really, it's valuable. Yeah, yeah no, I, I totally agree. No, and, and no, it makes sense that that's a valuable counterpoint. What the, the, the scripture that I was trying to um, sort of use to wrangle my thoughts down is, and I, I've used this on the show before in different contexts, but it's uh, what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verses 5 through 6. He's talking about prayer, but he says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. And he says, truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And in verse six, he says, but when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. And he says, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And there's so many different ways to connect that, you know, to unpack that scripture and what it's saying in the broader context of life. But what it spoke to me about in the context of what Velvet Buzzsaw gave me was that those who create and produce for the sake of commerce and commodity, that's their reward. That's all they get. But there is such a richness to artistry and creativity. Um, And this is not to say that, you know, oh, no art should ever be seen, but that's that's kind of what Josephina's perspective is. That's what she's asking. Right, she's right. like, you know, what is what is it what does it mean or what is art if it if it can't be seen? And it's it's just it just strikes out to me. It's like there is a beauty and a power in the process and in the connection. Um the 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 Lord makes all of the heavens and the earth and steps back and says, That's good. And that's the and, and that's that's it. That's the end of it. He just he he makes And that's something that I think we could gleam a lot from in our efforts to actualize our dreams and to actualize our hopes and and sort of to to be what we feel or to get out of ourselves what we feel is there within us. Um, I think there's a power in just representing like, yeah, I, I could do this thing to be seen by everyone else. And that will probably, in your extrapolation of the hobo man, that will probably make me more invisible than I will feel like all eyes are on me if I can just be present in my moment, in my space, doing what I love to do, being who I love to be, and let that speak for itself. And I think there's a tremendous power in that that we lose when we try to produce for certain ends. Does that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm actively resisting not taking this to this to a whole cosmological level by <laughs> with a notion like you know I feel like we've brought this up on the podcast once particularly before about a strain of theological thought out there that man's existence and purpose is to glorify God that, that that's what God is after and I would in the spirit of Velvet Bus or at least the themes we're talking about the joy of creation itself I think is mm. the value God derives from our existence. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, mm. like he loves creating good things and yeah. thus here yeah. we are. Well, what's our purpose? Well, what would you like your purpose to be? You mm. know, what, what, mm. what meaning would you like to infuse into your essence and self? Yeah. Um, your, your, your very existence is a pleasure. Mm. Um, yeah. Love you know. for for being loved, just that yeah. that yeah. that we are loved because, or that we love because he first loved us, and that that that's really all there is to it is that he endows us with that affection, and yeah, it's. I it, mean, it's you can powerful. you can take this you can take this to so many levels, like you know the act of creation um, that Malkovich is exercising. Think about your own children; like you don't you don't have kids because you want them to be a good commodity for you one day. Mm. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like yeah. like. 
you have kids because there's joy that yeah. you want present in the world and and that is a good enough end in itself no it's absolutely. maybe maybe the highest end you know yeah uh, Mal- malkovich knows the tide is coming in yet still the act of creation is a joy and that's, nothing there's a lot there's a lot to be taken away from that I, i'm sure that you would echo the same thing about your daughters but uh few things if anything brings me more joy uh, that my son would do uh, for me or tangential to me than when I just lay down on the the bed and he's like trying to get to sleep and he just cuddles up next to me or something. Sure. That that's yep. like there's so there's so much uh, just full and vibrant love in that moment uh, that that asks nothing of either one of us. It is it is purely just that affection for affection's sake. And, uh, yeah, and I think that we lose a lot of that in our, even in our spiritual language, in our spiritual, uh, sort of identities, just this, this comprehension that the Lord, uh, as we would express it, as I would express it, as, as I feel we both believe, um, uh, that the Lord just, the Lord just loves you. Like he just loves right. you. And, and the desire of anything, if anything, uh, is probably first and foremost, just draw near, be close. And that is, that is what. The, that is where the desire probably begins and ends because what can right, we do right. that would be impressive? Uh, you know, the, what what could we do that would be anything of any sort of magnitude against what we believe uh, the Almighty Creator has done? But there's just that affection of just draw close, be close, play, enjoy, you know, uh, be fruitful, multiply, do what I, you know, enjoy what I have, have gifted you to enjoy. And it's, just, yeah, there's a power that we, in that, that I feel like we too often lose because we make it about other people's validations, other people's recognitions, other people's visibility, and other people's seeing and hearing uh, instead of when, you know, just going to that quiet place, that secret place, and and just being. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Man, oh man. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm on board for Velvet Bus. <laughs> Well, <laughs> shall we shall we go to the fog meter then, Reed? It let's, is time. Let's go. To let's go to, go to the, fog the fog meter, meter developed specifically and most recently for 2019, uh the fog meter we are going to assess uh Velvet Buzzsaw on a fear scale um from a scare standpoint and on a god scale for us a substance standpoint. Um and then we'll uh assign a metric to it. Um and then we'll have a little bit of a a recommendation conversation. Yeah, exactly. Um, so f- I'll start. In terms of my fear uh, quotient for Velvet Buzzsaw, I might give it honestly a three. I don't okay. think it's very yeah. scary. I think there's some... Honestly, Hobo Man at first uh, appearance is very uh, off-putting. And, He's alarming. And kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of unsettling. Um, but something about the tone, the further it gets, the less kind of some of the scares really worked for me. So uh, I think I'm going to land at a three on the square, the, the square, the scare <laughs> quotient. Yeah, I'm not far off from you in terms of, like I said, I wasn't really expecting nightmares. And I think there's some suspense moments. There's some freakiness to it. But I'm going to land on a four uh, for the fear uh, factor, as it were. Now, <laughs> substance is tough because I'm t- I'm actively torn in this moment about how much did I bring to this and how much did Gilroy infuse with it? I'm going li- to, I'm going to err on the benefit of the doubt side because I think Gilroy, from what you've extrapolated about some of the interview, the interview you heard and the brief things that I've read, I think he put a lot of thought and time into this. So I'm going to give this a full blown six on the substance meter. I think there's, um, I think there's plenty here worth gleaming beyond just the rudimentary superficial sort of surface level thing. So, uh, so six for me on the God meter. I think relative to other films we've done, that is fair. Um, I think, I think I'm going to land at a five. I feel like it's measured. I feel like you, I I feel like at the top of the conversation, I might've actually been hovering more towards a three, but the, the, you know, conversation has pulled it up a little bit. So I'm going to land at a five on the substance meter all right so that means in our newly minted fog meter which definitely has uh uh different layers to it than the previous metric we had um we actually give velvet buzzsaw a four and a half out of ten uh on the fog meter uh which is you know feels almost like a ding but uh that brings me to my next question which is in general and i think i know your answer but in general would you recommend this film um no 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I think I think there are aspects I like, um, but none of none of them are enough to say, hey, Friday night, check this one out. No. I sure. No, I understand. Um, I'm going to give a soft recommendation to this film. I think uh, there's there's something there to be gleamed, particularly if you are interested in what the film's trying to explore. Um, obviously, I gleamed a lot from it, so I'm, in, I'm immensely glad that I saw it. Might even uh, revisit it at some later date. Um, so I'm going to give it a, a not a wholehearted recommendation, but a soft recommendation from me. <laughs> it is funny. I, I, I almost feel like our recommendation factor needs couching because I'm like, I have three kids. Uh, I'm married. <laughs> I have a job in a world, which this isn't you by any means in a world where I have total discretionary time, that recommendation might get flip flopped and be like, sure, go for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> right, but no, in a, in a very little discretionary time type of life, I'm like, nah, there's nah. better things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there it is. There's our conversation about velvet buzzsaw entry number three in our hashtag Netflix and chills series. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, check it out if you will. Um, and then, uh, we will see you guys next week when we are talking about a film that you have likely seen if Netflix's, uh, a reported, lot of people dem- apparently have. <laughs> yeah, if they're reported dem- Demographics uh, are to be believed. We are diving in uh, to the behemoth of the streaming service. Uh, the Sandra Bullock starring Bird Box is next week. So if you are one of the four people who have not yet watched Bird Box, then uh, check it out and we will meet you back here next week. Nathan, thank you so much for having Great. this conversation. And I personally You're welcome, brother. may be in the minority, but I personally want to thank you for compelling me to see Velvet Buzzsaw because it gave me a lot <laughs> to think about. You are welcome. And if that's, <laughs> hey, art for art's sake, brother, if, that, if, if I take joy out of your joy taking. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you next see week. See you next week, guys. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but it is not the end of the conversation. You can continue this conversation in a variety of ways. On Twitter, at The Fear of God. On Instagram, at Fear of God Podcast. You can like or follow us on Facebook or join the Fear of God Facebook discussion group. Follow Reed on Twitter, at Reed Lackey. And Nathan, at The Nathan Rouse. Email us at fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com or visit more than one lesson.com to comment on the official episode posts. And lastly, if you listen to us through iTunes, we would greatly appreciate a rating or a review. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Hi everybody.